Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey, hello, and how are you? And welcome to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we discuss some of the best moments, best names, and best memories in sports history. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and I hope that you're having a good day, good evening, or a good night, wherever you're listening to us. And we're back again with another show highlighting the best in sports history, and I appreciate you taking time out to give us a listen. And please, as a reminder, subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear here and check out our Twitter page at Historically SP2 for your daily dose of sports history. Now, on today's episode, we're going to be talking to former executive director of the Pro Football Researchers Association and the founder of the Pro of the Football Learning Academy, Mr. Ken Crippen, who is a friend of not only this show, but the network as well, as we talk to NFL playoffs along with the project, the Football Learning Academy. That's our main event. Later in the show is our shout out as we salute not one, but two teams that made the 1995 NFL playoffs one of the most memorable of all time and one that captured the imagination of an entire nation. And of course, we have our usual top five memorable moments from the week of January 9th through January the 15th. So pump up the pump up the volume and you're listening to Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. The Pigskin Tales Podcast is all about the lesser known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Brad Tarkenton and Harold Red Grange. But have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Now streaming on your favorite music platform. Go to pigskintales.com. And we're back here on the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. I am your host, Dana Augusta. And once again, we're right back at it. And today we have a special guest on board, a man by the name of Ken Crippen, who is the former executive director of the Pro Football Researchers Association. He's also the founder of the Football Learning Academy. And today we're going to be talking about some of the things that he's been doing, which has been, to me, very fascinating. And also we're going to be talking to him about the playoff games that are taking place right now. We're recording this on Sunday morning, so uh, we've had a couple of games already in the books, including the Buffalo Bills uh, knocking off the New England Patriots uh, 47-17, to and he is actually a Bills fan. So we're going to start off with that. Uh, How you doing, Ken? Good, Good to have you aboard this morning. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, Bills last night, they knock off the hated um, New England Patriots last night, 47-17. And I saw a stat earlier this morning is that the Bills has handed Bill Belichick three of his worst losses as a coach. I mean, got to be some Bills got to have something on him, you know, even though they've, you know, for the most part, Bill has had the upper hand on you guys. But whenever y'all guys, whenever you guys beat, beat them, it seems like they, you, you do a pretty good job on them. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, 
that's the case. I mean, for, you know, over a decade, almost two decades now, the Patriots have been winning the division and handily taking over uh, the Bills whenever they play them. But, uh, yeah, like you said, those times when they do meet uh, and the Bills do become victorious, that uh, they do it pretty well. And and last night was definitely something that uh, was in the record books for some of the things that happened, you know, as far as the number of consecutive drives with a touchdown. Uh, I think it's also the first game in NFL history that there was no punts and no field goals. So wow. um, that was a pretty interesting thing to learn about. That, and that obviously so. Um, but let's talk about your, your academy. First of all, it's a football learning academy. And talk about it, that and how you got it started. Well, I've been researching and writing about pro football history for, I think, over 30 years now. So I've been doing it for a while. And what I wanted to do is really be able to teach people about the history of the game. So if you watch NFL Network, you watch ESPN, stuff like that. It's like most of football history doesn't exist. If it's before the Super Bowl, then, you know, it never happened. And I want to make sure people understand that there was a lot of history that happened prior to the beginning of the Super Bowl. Also, I want people to be able to put the current game into historical context. So I started the Football Learning Academy. We're actually officially launching in June, but uh, we've had uh, a few classes loaded in there already. And we'll be loading more in uh, leading into April, which is our soft launch. And it's basically focusing on various aspects of pro football history. So um, there's classes, there's videos, uh, things to educate people on, like I said, various aspects of pro football history. Okay, well, I mean, that sounds like something that I would have been interested in when I was younger, when I was a kid. But uh, I had to, you know, be like everybody else reading about it and things like that. But you have come together with a whole class. And I took a look at some of the things that you've actually put together, like scouting reports of different players from back in the day. Tell how you started that and how you came up with that idea, which to me is fascinating. It's something where, you know, again, it falls back into what I was talking about before, where a lot of history prior to the Super Bowl has never been discussed. So when you hear players' names uh, that are from the earlier days, most people have either never heard of them or have no idea how good they really were, uh, especially when you're talking about Hall of Fame discussions, uh, the seniors' candidates. Uh, You hear these names and you really don't know who they are or how well they played. So basically, I've gone through a lot of old game film and analyzed each of these players and put together a scouting report. So uh, a colleague of mine, Matt Reeser, and I um, have taken a look at that, and we've created these scouting reports. So depending on how much film we have, you know, some players we have a lot of film, others we don't have much film at all. But this helps give people that perspective of how well these players actually were back in those days. So we give scoring, we give rankings, things like that um, for each of these uh, players and their scouting reports. Now, do you find it difficult to, like, when you kind of start comparing players from different eras, do you find that difficult to do? Because, you know, of course, the game is completely different than, like, say, 1975 compared to what it was, say, in 1945. You know, and we have, the, you know, me and some of my buddies have discussions all the time, and it's kind of hard to compare the two eras. Do you find that, find that difficult as well? Depends on how you want to look at it. If you're just looking at statistics, then yeah, it's going to be impossible to look at it because statistics without any sort of context are meaningless. So you take a look at, say, you know, you want to compare quarterbacks and you look at passing yards. Well, you look at Vinny Testaverde, he's got more passing yards than Joe Montana, who belongs in the Hall of Fame. So you can't really just look at statistics. You have to put everything in context. And when I'm evaluating players across eras, what I'd like to do is you see how well they played within their particular era and see how they stack up there. So if you see somebody like a Don Hudson, who was just absolutely dominant, you compare his statistics to players nowadays, you're going to say that, well, he really wasn't that good. But no, he was. He was dominant. And when you look at uh, the players within that era, how he compared, you can do that across eras. And so that's how I look at things uh, in different time periods with different rules, all those types of things. When you, if you talk about Don Hudson, it's amazing because he played in an era where everybody pretty much ran the ball and he was sort of like the Jerry Rice of that era. But at a time when 
you didn't really throw the ball too much. I mean, he had a great quarterback with him at the, at the time with the Packers. And then you had other guys like Sammy Ball who was throwing the ball all over the lot too. But if you really, and maybe even uh, Sid Luckman at the time. But if you really sit and think about it, they really didn't throw the ball as much. But the, the type of statistics that he put up, and you compare it to somebody later on, like say a Charlie Joyner, you know, that was just. <clears throat> You know, he, he he had the record for the longest time. In fact, Lance Allworth, I'm a Charger fan, by the way, and mm. Lance Allworth broke his record earlier, you know, when he was playing, you know, for I think most receptions, I think, for a career. I think he broke that record in 69 and because they threw the ball a lot. And they didn't throw the ball too much when you think of Don Hudson, but Don Hudson was considered the Jerry Rice of that era. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You got to look at things within context. And when you have – teams you know like the chargers who are throwing a lot during those days yeah you're going to rack up a lot of statistics and so you want to see how those statistics compare uh, with other teams of that era and then also across different eras so by looking at how well they dominated within their particular era uh, you can add that context to those statistics so you look at don hudson's stats well how do they compare to the other receivers of that time um, that you know shows how dominant he really was. Like you said, he, they really weren't throwing a lot, but when they were throwing, he was getting large gains, and a lot of it was because of the way that he was running his routes, uh, the way that he was able to break tackles, all of those types of things. So it showed how dominant he really was as a receiver, um, and then you can take that across the different errors to see that, yeah, he's in the same league as Jerry Rice as the two greatest receivers of all time. Now, when you, in your research, when you putting together these scouting reports, which I, again, find just amazingly fascinating, was there someone that you came across that just, just surprised you totally? Like, I didn't know he was, I knew he was good, but I didn't know he was that good. Was there anybody that just stuck out, you know, when you're doing this type of, this type of research, putting together these scouting reports? Uh, yeah, I would say there's two of them. And these are two people that I, for probably the last 10, 15 years, have been trying to get into the Hall of Fame. That would be Laverne Dillwig and Al Wistard. Okay. Laverne Dillwig, I knew that he was a great end with the Packers. And, you know, he got overshadowed because obviously Don Hudson followed him. And so you're not really going to know about who came before Don Hudson. But when I watched game film of Laverne Dillwig, it was just amazing to me just how fast he really was. I mean, you look at it, you got somebody at the defensive end position with 27 interceptions. I mean, you look at the other ends of that era and you combine them together and you're looking at single digits for their careers. Wow. And so you get somebody like Laverne Dillwig and he comes up with 27 interceptions from the defensive end position. You compare that to Don Hudson. He was playing a defensive back. And he's got 30. That's more understandable <laughs> that somebody playing. I mean, I mean first of all, 30. 27 intercepted from a defensive end? That's Yeah, when you watch of. him on film, it was unbelievable just how fast he was. So whether it's, you know, getting off the ball to get into the backfield or dropping back into coverage to cover a back or cover an end, he was unbelievably fast. And that's why he was able to get that many interceptions. And People, you look at it, and it's just shocking that he's not in the Hall of Fame. you got somebody that all pro every year but one of his entire career. He was six-time consecutive consensus all pro, four-time consecutive unanimous all pro, statistical leader in categories for multiple seasons. How is he not in the Hall of Fame? It, That's amazing. I mean, I mean, every time I have conversations with guys like you, I learn something new. I think, you know, I... I I pride myself on knowing a lot, but every time I have conversations with, with, with guys like you, I learn something new that I didn't know. And this is one case. Just, that's unbelievable. You know, 27 interceptions from a defensive end, not a DB, not a safety, but a defensive end. You know, mm-hmm. and you mentioned someone else that kind of surprised you. Who was that? Uh, Al Wistard. Okay. Um, I knew that he was good, uh, but watching the game film of him, He was excellent, you know, especially on offense, but, you know, he didn't, wasn't too shabby on defense too. So he's another guy that I believe definitely belongs in the pro football hall of fame. Both of those guys were finalists in the centennial class, but didn't make it through. 
Um, but both of them have unbelievably strong cases to get in there. And, um, yeah, without Wister, he's playing offensive line. So you're not going to see statistics and things like that. So it's tougher to make that case. But when you watch him on film, you will see how great he really was. And you'll see that he deserves to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And hopefully, you know, in the scattering report that Matt and I put together, that you're able to see just how dominant he was. No, no, no. Al Wister, I know the name, but remind me, where, who did he play for? Played for the Eagles. I, I, I figured he played. I think he, I, I remember that hearing that name with the Eagles and he played uh, right around the time of, you know, those, those championship teams in with, with, Ram, with, uh, not Van Brocklin, but with, um, Van Buren. And, Van Buren. That's right. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, with Van Buren and, you know, those guys, yeah, um, Yeah, if you want to take a look at the 1948 championship game, people are always talking about the block and the ice bowl that Jerry Kramer had. Yeah, Take a look at Al Wistert's block when he opened a hole for Van Buren at the end of the game for their – To score the only touchdown in in the snowstorm at Shy Park, yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, you look at the ice bowl and what Kramer was able to do um, on that icy, snowy surface – uh, to get that hole enough for uh, the winning score. Al Wister took on two people, rotated them around 90 degrees to open up a hole that even I could run through in order to get that score. It was a huge hole on a snowy surface. So if you want to induct somebody based on a block like they're doing with Jerry Kramer's really case, yeah, right. absolutely Al Wister had a better block in the 48 championship game and nobody talks about it. Ah, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, some of the things that you're doing on that website and some of the things that you're doing with the football, I, I, like I said, I read a little bit about you and, you know, you had a, you actually have a couple of books that you've published, you know, talk about those. All right. Um, first book I did was on the Syracuse Athletic Association that played in the late 1800s. Uh, the second book I did was on the Buffalo Bills of the All-America Football Conference. Uh, then I was managing editor of a few other books. Uh, one is an encyclopedia on the All-America Football Conference. The other is on um, the early pro football history. Uh, so basically taking it as the game was forming up to the 1919 season prior to the beginning of the NFL. And then a contributor to a few other books, one on the Packers and one that's going to be coming out uh, in a couple of years on the 64 Buffalo Bills. Now the '64 Buffalo Bills, as a Chargers fan, that 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 hurts me because that was the the year after they won the championship over the Patriots, and of course everybody knows about the great Mike Stratton hit, which denied us the second championship. But we're not going to go into that too much. Uh, okay. Heath Lincoln's still feeling it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I probably probably is. Um, but yeah, that, that that '64 team, the game where I remember, the, I remember reading about it and watching the film of it. It was in Buffalo, played at a War Memorial Stadium, and it was what people called else football's version of the shot heard around the world, where Mike Stratton laid out Keith Lincoln, um, and then from that point on, the Chargers weren't the same after that because he was the, Lincoln was the input was the, the the spark plug for that Charger team in '63 that blasted the Patriots in at Balboa Stadium, but um, but that '64 um, that was like the first of the back to back. Buffalo Bills teams that won AFL championships and they could have won three in a row because they people forget they could have gone to the first Super Bowl had they beaten the Chiefs um going to that first Super Bowl so that I mean those are some very good teams which with um with with Jack Kemp at quarterback Cookie Gilchrist at running back you know you had you know El, um, Elbert Dubinian th- those guys was on that team I mean that was a really really good Bills team yeah especially when you look at their defense as well I mean, they didn't give up a rushing touchdown the entire season. Now that 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 is a stat that that's unbelievable. Like a whole that a team did not give up a rushing touchdown for an entire season. You yeah, know, anchored by that, that defense be- was anchored by Harry Jacobs and a young Marty Schottenheimer. You know, I mean, you had uh, a few other guys on the uh, Bird was on the back was was the defensive back. His first name I hate me right now, but uh, Butch uh, Bird. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Tom um, Sestak, yeah, Tom Day, both of those guys. I mean, Sestak is somebody that, you know, was unbelievable. Um, you know, he did have a, a shorter career, um, but, you know, he's somebody that definitely deserves recognition. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they had an unbelievable defense back then. So the offense usually gets, you know, all the credit for things. And 
the defense, you know, really showed up all those years, and that's what made them so good. Right. Now let's go a little bit, you know, kind of to modern day and, and some of the playoff games that we had yesterday. We touched on the Bills a little bit. Pretty much right now we touched on the Bills. You know, everybody remembers that, the, the, you know, the team that went to four straight Super Bowls and lost them all, unfortunately. Uh, didn't want to bring that up too, too much. But uh, the Bills had some very, you know, when I think of the Buffalo Bills, of course you think of those Jim Kelly teams, but a lot of people don't realize how good the, those Buffalo Bills teams was in the early 80s with Joe Ferguson and Joe Cribs and Frank Lewis, a receiver. I mean, they, they had some really good teams in the early 80s, especially with a defense with Fred Smurless and company. Yeah, and, you know, you'd think that, you know, they kind of went into a, a nosedive after – um you know, the early 70s where they had O.J. Simpson and the electric company and stuff, and then they dropped off a little bit. But then, yeah, they picked up in the 80s, uh, dropped off a little bit before um, doing the run for the four Super Bowls. And, you know, they got close to the Super Bowl the year before they they went to the first one, you know, playing against, uh, I think it was the Bengals in 89. So, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, they've had some some really good teams, Um but yeah, people always look at uh, they lost four Super Bowls, ignore that they won two championships. But uh, yeah, yeah, four Super Bowls, and the, and that's all they talk about. You know, and then the game earlier that yesterday afternoon, the Bengals winning their first playoff game since 1991. Uh, I was, you know, just not to give away my age too much. I was a senior in high school the last time the Bengals had won a playoff game and they beat the Raiders, which is gives me a little bit of satisfaction because the Raiders had beat my team the week before. And that's my dad's team. And me and my dad have been going back and forth. Um, that Bengals team in the early, in the late eighties, early nineties, that Boomer Esiason led team with Icky Woods and, and the re- and, and um, the receivers Tim McGee and Eddie Brown. I mean, those were some really good teams back then too. Yeah, I mean, you know, they made the Super Bowl twice, so you know you can't be too shabby if you're doing that. Uh, unfortunately, they lost both times, but you know, still to be able to make it uh, is definitely an accomplishment. So, yeah, when you're thinking about the Bengals, I mean, obviously there's recency bias when people look at it that they've been struggling for a little while. Uh, but they've definitely got their act together and they've been playing well with Burrow at quarterback and you know, he's shown a lot of promise. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of great things coming out of him. Oh yeah, absolutely. You've been, and then, you know, their first Super Bowl was like a co- totally different team than when they went the second time in the early eighties, when they had Ken Anderson, which in my opinion is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in NFL history. And I think should be in a hall of fame, you know, because yeah, I mean, there's was, definitely um, because he pretty much was the the first quarterback to to have the West Coast offense, you know, under Walsh during the early seventies. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely before uh, Walsh took it out to San Francisco because Walsh was on the staff of the Bengals, so that's where he started refining some of it and then continued that work once he got to San Francisco. But yeah, I mean, Ken Anderson's name definitely comes up. Ken Riley's name comes up. Willie Anderson is now a a finalist this year so who knows if he's going to make it but um yeah there haven't been uh i think there's only one cincinnati Bengal munoz that's in yep. the uh the hall of fame right now so uh, there's a big push to uh take a look at some of those great Bengals players and see if we can get some more people in there and so i think willie anderson's probably got the best shot this year um and then we'll see on the senior side whether uh riley and anderson have a chance yeah. Then, then you got the games that that's going on today. The Eagles against Tampa Bay. This is a rematch of the last game ever played at the Vet. You know, in in I think it was a two thousand two NFC Championship game between the when the Bucks defeated the Eagles and went on to the Super Bowl against the Raiders. Um, the uh, the Eagles. You know, they're back in it again after winning the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And we touched on, you know, some of those great Eagles teams in the late 40s, you know, with Van Buren and Wistard and all of those guys, you know, and they beat the Cardinals in a snowstorm and two of the worst. I actually won two championships and two of the worst weather games ever. You had to beating them, beating the Cardinals in 1948 in a snowstorm at, at Shy Park. And then the next year, playing the Rams in L.A., and they played that game in a monsoon, in an unseasoned, just, just an unusual 
rainy day at the LA Coliseum. You know, talk about that game a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that, you know, the Eagles are really strong. And when you're looking at uh, the comparisons between the National Football League and the All-America Football Conference and the Cleveland Browns, how dominant they were, they were really looking forward to 1950 when those two leagues got together and then the Browns were able to take on the Eagles. And, you know, you would think that the uh, they would probably split that season. They played two games, but the Browns just came in and just dominated the Eagles. Um, so, yeah, it's it's something where you definitely wanted to see those matchups with how strong the Eagles were in 48 and 49. You were expecting the same in 50. And then the Cleveland Browns, how dominant they were coming into 50, playing those uh, those Philadelphia Eagles. And, um, yeah, it was a, a classic matchup. And the, the Browns proved that they weren't, uh, they weren't a minor league team. They were major league, and they came to play. That's right. I actually did a podcast episode a few months back dealing with the 1950 Browns and that game against it that they had against the um, the Eagles. They called it the very first football World Series because you had the Eagles, the defending NFL champs against the champions of the AAFC and the Cleveland Browns played at Memorial Stadium in Philadelphia. And the Browns ended up coming in there and crushing them 35 to 10. And I think that it might have been just a little bit of like, yeah, yeah, they won the AAFC. They were, you know, they were good at that league, but this is the NFL. This is where the real ball is. But then Cleveland came in with Paul Brown and Dub Jones and those and Otto Graham, and they just came in there and just really showed them what the AAFC was all about, pretty much. Yeah, I've inter- interviewed a lot of AAFC players, and one thing I specifically ask them, especially the ones that played in both leagues, they say, okay, who is the stronger league? Because NFL is always going to say, well, every other league that goes against us is a minor league. They're useless. They're not, um, they're not as strong as us, stuff like that. Um, so I asked the players, and every single one of them said that the AAFC was at least as good as the NFL, if not better. And they pointed to the Cleveland Browns as a result of that. The only thing that could even be negative uh, or even slightly negative was one player had said, the worst teams in the AAFC were worse than the worst teams in the NFL. Mm. But then, you know, said that, well, but the best teams in the AAFC were better than the best teams in the NFL. And again, pointing to the Cleveland Browns, you got the New York Yankees, you got the San Francisco 49ers as they were getting toward the end of the league. So those were the teams that, you know, they said were at least on par, if not better than anything in the NFL. And, the Cleveland Browns kind of proved that when they came into the NFL and they won the championship that first year and went to the championship game several years after that, winning, winning a few of them along the way. So That's uh, right. they, they, the, they were, uh, you know, Eagles are playing the Buccaneers today. And, you know, I always, you know, the Bucs are the defending Super Bowl champions. They won the Super Bowl beating the Raiders in Super Bowl 36. But when I think of the Buccaneers, I think of the creamsicle orange uniforms from the 70s. And in fact, just to, again, show my age here, the very first jersey I ever got in my life, my uncle lived in Florida and he got me a Leroy Selman jersey. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was like 1980. You know, and I had become a, a Bucks fan for like about two minutes until I, until I discovered the Chargers. But, um, but that that team with Doug Williams and Leroy Selman, they shocked the world going from worst to first in 79 and gone from nine points away from going to the Super Bowl. You know, and I've always loved that team. And, and of course, John McKay with some of the, his wisecracks. Um, that team was just incredible. It was, it was so much fun to watch, you know, as, you know, with Doug Williams at quarterback and um, James Wilder at running back. And you had Jimmy Giles at tight end. Uh, that team was really, really good good just for the, that little short space of time yeah they were it's one of those things where you know obviously they struggled a lot when they first came into the league uh as what the first two seasons they lost 26 games or something so yeah they struggled but then they put it together pretty quick they were able to you know start performing very well and then fell off again and you now one interesting stat that i did see about tampa bay is that of the teams that are in the playoffs this year, they have the second least amount of playoff appearances in their history. The wow. one that's got the least is the Arizona Cardinals, and they have the longest franchise history. 
So <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. That, that is uh, interesting. That, you know, the, the Cardinals, who, you know, one of the founding members of the NFL, has only got 11 playoff appearances in their entire history. Dang. That's, Tampa that, Bay's that, got 12, that, and they came in in 76. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and when you talk about you know, the, you know the, the Arizona Cardinals, which we were getting to in, in a bit, um, they've been around pretty much as a as an operation since 1898. You know, and they started off as a semi pro league in Chicago, and then they joined the NFL. You know, and shared Chicago with you know the, the of course the Bears, and then they moved to St. Louis. And I remember those St. Louis teams, but whenever you talk about the Cardinals, I always go back to the Cardinals of the mid seventies was another team that was really good for a very short space in time, you know, with Don Coriel as the coach and Jim Hart at, at quarterback, another great quarterback that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah. And that's one of those things too, is that, you know, they were in Chicago for so long. You so you think about that, and then you know obviously the recency bias again is you know them as Phoenix Cardinals and Arizona Cardinals, but yeah they had that time in St. Louis, uh, and I think that's also overshadowed by the fact that you had the Rams in St. Louis as well, and with the success that the Rams had, uh, it kind of overshadows what happened with the Cardinals. But yeah, I mean, taking a look at some of these teams throughout history, I mean a lot of them were very successful for a short amount of time. And unfortunately, they get forgotten because everybody's looking at dynasties. You know, you look at the dynasty of the Browns back in the 40s and 50s. I mean, you're looking at the Packers of the 60s. You're looking at, uh, I mean, the Cowboys and the uh, Steelers playing well in the 70s, 49ers in the 80s, et cetera. So everybody's looking at those big dynasties. But yet, you know, you have those teams like the Cardinals who played well for a short period of time. And unfortunately, stuff like that gets forgotten. Yeah, I mean, I think the Cardinals could kind of, if you really think about it, has something of a cult following, the St. Louis Cardinals of the mid-70s. They have something of a cult following because they have such a really diverse group of talented players on that team that a lot of them arguably should be in the Hall of Fame because you had the number that Jim Hart put up at that time. You know, he was like one of the top tier quarterbacks in the league, but of course you being overshadowed by the Steelers and the Cowboys and I mean you look within their own division you had the Cowboys and Redskins in the mid in the seven in the mid 70s and they were dominant but they won two division titles they beat those two teams to win the division and they kind of gotten like lost they, they, they kind of gotten lost because of people always think about the Cardinals of the 60s which wasn't that great and then you had the Cardinals eventually moving to Phoenix and all those all those long losing seasons all those years they've had losing seasons they kind that those that team kind of gets lost yeah i would definitely agree with that and you know it gets back to you know people look at the dominance of some of the other teams of that era and when you have that short span of success, uh, it kind of gets overshadowed uh, by Cowboys, by Packers, or no, not Packers at that time, the Steelers at that time. So it's one of those things where people need to really start focusing on some of those great teams and really talking about it like you're talking about it and letting people know about the history that, yeah, you know, there were some successful teams within the franchise history. Let's talk about them. Let's get that information out there. You know, and then we got the, you know, ironically, they play in the Rams today, which used to used to reside in St. Louis. Um, but the Rams of the 70s also, I, 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 I love, you know, the decade of the 60s and 70s in football, because that's what I really mainly know a lot about. And I'm going back and back in the 30s and 40s and, you know, even back in the early years of the NFL, learning about that as well. But most of the stuff that I know of, I mean, deep, deep down are like from the what I call the NFL films era of foot of of the NFL, going back to the early 60s. And because that's where a lot of my NFL knowledge comes from is from NFL films growing up watching those. People forget how good the LA Rams were in the seventies. Even though they didn't, they didn't make the Super Bowl until nineteen eighty with a backup quarterback and, and had, if I'm not mistaken, still have the worst record of any team ever to play in the Super Bowl. But those Rams teams under Chuck Knox and from you know they won the division 
what, six straight years? They won the NFC West six straight years? Now, that could be taken two ways. They were really dominant, which they were, but they really, but they also played in a somewhat weak division with the, with the 49ers, Falcons, and Saints at the time were not very good teams, but they would always end up losing in the playoffs to either Dallas or Minnesota. You know, those, and, but they had some really great teams in the 70s. They really did. They did. And, you know, you even dig deeper into their franchise history. I mean, they won the championship back in 45. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they played well back then. And in 51. And in 51, because they had knocked off the Browns the next year in 51. Yeah. 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 So they made the championship game. Yeah. So you got 49, you got 50, you got 51. They were in the championship game and, you know, they won it in 51. But you know, you take a look at it. You're talking a, a team that after they win a championship, they relocate. Yeah. I mean, how's that? You know, the only other team Cleveland. to do that was the Chiefs when they won the AFL title in 62. Two. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, with the Dallas Texans in the next season, they move out of Dallas to KC. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's it's something that, you know, as a fan base, you're sitting there supporting them and then they win the championship and then they they're in another city the next year. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, but yeah, I mean, you start digging into their history. There's, you know, definitely some times when, you know, they were dominant and, you know, they also had, you know, we start talking about some other pro football history stuff here. The first ones with the painted helmets too, with the logo yes. on the helmet. So um, that was 48, I think Fred Gerke uh, yeah. came up with that. And um, yeah, he was hand painting them in his garage and stuff. So <laughs> and then he'd take paint with them on uh on the road trips and so he could touch it up at the games and everything. So, yeah, I mean, that um, there's some history with that franchise and it goes back to the American football league in 1936. Yeah. Um, so there's, there are some teams that have that extended history. You got the Cardinals, you got the Rams, uh, the Packers, obviously too. I mean, they started in 1919, but didn't uh, get into the league until 1921. So there's a lot of history in the playoffs this year. And, you know, it's great that you have people like you talking about that history so that people can can see that. And, you know, like I said before, put today's game into historical context. And, you know, that's what I what I try to do myself. And I'm glad to see people like yourself doing that as well to try to get this history out there so that people know it. Well, I really appreciate that, Ken. Um, the last game that we're going to talk about is the, 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 the night game tonight between Pittsburgh and Kansas City. Now, Kansas City has, I think, one of the most interesting postseason histories I've ever, ever read about. They won the championship, the AFL championship in 62. They won the AFL championship again as the Kansas City Chiefs in 66. They go to the Super Bowl in 69 again. But it wasn't until 1971 that they have their first home playoff game, which yeah. was the NFL's longest game ever. Yeah, I, and that's amazing, you know, when you think about it, that you made it to multiple championship games, and yet you were on the road the entire time. Yeah. You know, when they went to Super Bowl four, they had to beat the Jets, who was the defending AFL champs and defending Super Bowl champs, for that matter. And they had to play them at Shea Stadium in bad, cold, windy weather at Shea Stadium, which was known for its wind, which was known for just having bad weather in January. And then the next week, they go on the road again to face the arch rival Raiders, which they had lost, I think, six consecutive times to the Raiders in Oakland you know, including the playoffs and stuff like that. And Hank Stram and Dawson and Taylor ended up winning that game and ended up going to Super Bowl four. But all that time, all that success, all that, you know, all that time that in Kansas City and in Dallas, they had never played a post a home postseason game until 1971. Yeah. I, again, it's still surprising that, you know, that happened that, you know, they make, make it that far within the playoffs winning championships and they always had to be on the road and (laughs) so that's uh yeah that's something that uh people don't think about nowadays i mean with the uh the current super bowls you know they think about it's like okay well how many wild card teams have made it to a super bowl and how many people have had to go on the road in order to get to the super bowl things like that but you didn't think about it back in those days and you know again it's it's good that 
people like you are bringing that kind of stuff up so that people know about that and can understand it that yeah they won three afl championships but it wasn't easy to be able to do that they had to they had to play on the road in order to be able to get those championships that's right and then there is a rematch of the 93 wild card game which was the first game that Joe Montana started in the playoffs other than the 49ers. He was the starting quarterback for the Chiefs that that afternoon in Kansas City at Arrowhead, which was the first postseason game ever played at Arrowhead. This was in 93. This was 21 years after Arrowhead opened. Mm-hmm. You know, that which again is and you know attributing to the weird and fascinating postseason history of the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that, that, you know, that's the type of thing that, you know, people aren't really talking about as much that, you know, you can have success as a team, but there are some hurdles that you have to overcome in order to be able to be successful. And when you're playing on the road, you're not at home. Um, And especially if you're playing on the road in elements, uh, it's far more difficult to be able to win. So when you look at those accomplishments, you need to take that into consideration to say, hey, these were some dominant teams to be able to overcome this type of stuff where they they never got to play at home. They always had to be on the road. Right. Well, Ken, what I need you to do right now is just to plug some of the things that you're doing, you know, just remind the audience out there some of the things that you have in store for us, for us sport, for us football fans, us football history buffs, as for that matter. What you got some of some things, what are some things that you got cooking up? Well, the biggest one is the Football Learning Academy, as we had talked about before. Uh, So if you want to go to www.football-learning-academy.com, you can see the blog posts that we're putting out. We've got a couple of classes out there right now. Uh, We're doing our soft launch in April, and then the hard launch is going to be in June. Uh, So at that point, you're going to see a lot more classes getting loaded in there. Um, But Yeah, that's the the biggest thing that I'm working on now. I'm still doing a little writing, doing some blogging. So you'll see the blog on that website as well. Uh, So, yeah, I'd say check it out and uh, hopefully join up some classes and uh, hopefully we can teach you something. All right, man. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining. This is uh, Ken Crippen. He was uh, formerly the the, uh, pro football researchers uh, uh, executive director and he's also starting up the he's also the founder actually of the football learning academy which as you said starting up within a few months so ken great having you aboard i really like talking to you and please come back man i really enjoyed this we gotta do this again sometime absolutely i'll be uh happy to come back anytime all right man thank you for joining us and we'll be right back all right man i appreciate it man Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, definitely a lot of fun talking about uh, fo- football history with you. Oh, yeah, man. It's, this was a lot of fun, man. You know, and, and as long as I talk football, now I'm in the mood for the games this afternoon. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I got you all amped up and ready to go. That's right. That's right. That's right. Here at the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, I'm your host, Dana Augusta, once again. And uh, just a reminder out there that if you're listening to this podcast, you are probably a serious sports fan like myself. And you need to check out newspapers.com, which is one of our main sponsors here at the network. Uh, You can get access to 640 million pages of news from the United States, from Canada, England, and all sorts of different places dating back to the 1700s. Now, to get a free one-week subscription to newspapers.com, you can do that by visiting the Sports History Network uh, com slash newspapers. And with that same paid subscription, you'll be also helping to support this podcast and others here at the network. And also, please check out our Twitter feed here at the uh, 
historically speaking sports, which is historically dot speaking dot sports at gmail.com. And finally, don't forget to please hit that subscribe button wherever you hear this podcast so you could get new episodes whenever they come out. Now, at this point in the show, we're going to talk. We usually talk about the top five sports moments throughout history that happened this past week and uh, this past week we've had some really great ones happen and uh, just go headlong into that here we go number five on january 14th 1968 the packers defeat the raiders 33 to 14 in super bowl two now this game wasn't really very memorable as far as like the standpoint of great plays or unbelievable matchups or whatever but what really would made the make it made the list was the fact that this was the final game coached by Vince Lombardi the, the final Packers game that he coached uh, he would later go on to become the head coach of the Redskins for one year before succumbing to cancer in 1970 but in this game in his in his final game on the sideline of the Packers he led the Packers to their second Super Bowl win over the AFL champ, which was the uh, Oakland Raiders that year. Uh, Green Bay quarterback Bart Starr was named the seat was named the league's um, the game's most valuable player for the second time. And Coach Lombardi would retire shortly after that game and become the head coach of the Redskins later on. You know, being away from football, he decided to do that, but he would die of cancer in 1970. And because winning his first two Super Bowls, the Super Bowl trophy would be ultimately named after him, obviously. Number four, the Raiders win Super Bowl eleven On January 9th, 1977, the Raiders were trying to shake that label of not being able to win the big one. So this time, they actually did. The Raiders would knock off the Minnesota Vikings 32-14 in Pasadena, California. Oakland wide receiver Fred Belitnikoff would be named the Super Bowl MVP. He had four catches for 97 yards and set up two Oakland, set up actually three Oakland Raider touchdowns. And it was the first Super Bowl win for the Silver and Black, and yet they will win two more Super Bowls over the next over the next six seasons. And they would be led by, of course, they were led by head coach John Madden, which that would be his first and only Super Bowl win. Number three. The Milwaukee Bucks end the Lakers 33 game winning streak. On January 9, 1972, the LA Lakers was on a winning streak that has never even been approached by any other pro sports franchise since. They had won 33 games in a row dating back to November 5th of 1971 when they had defeated the Baltimore Bullets 110 to 106. But this night the streak would end. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar led the Bucks with 39 points and 20 rebounds as they beat, beat the Lakers 120 to 104 at the Mecca Arena in downtown Milwaukee. LA, of course, would eventually get revenge by the Bucks, beating them four games to do in the Western Conference Finals that year and getting their first NBA championship after moving to Los Angeles by beating the Knicks in five games. Number two, simply known as the catch. On January 10th, 1982, the 49ers would punch their ticket to their very first Super Bowl by beating the Cowboys 28-27 in a wild back-and-forth game at Candlestick Park. The game would come down to the final 59 seconds, with the Niners trailing 27-21. Joe Montana rolled right and found Dwight Clark in the back of the end zone, which proved to be the game winner. The win vaulted the Niners to Super Bowl 16, where they beat the Bengals for their first of five Lombardi trophies. And the number one event that took place in history this past week, the Jets upset the Colts in Super Bowl III. Now, on January 12, 1969, the New York Jets, led by Joe Namath, were a 14-point underdog against the mighty Baltimore Colts in Super Bowl III. Now, the people had discounted the Jets because them being from an inferior league, the AFL, and the teams that played in the AF in the Super Bowl the past two seasons, the Raiders and Chiefs, were soundly defeated by the Colts. It was soundly be- defeated by the by the Packers, excuse me. And they thought that this the same was going to happen, maybe even worse, because the people were considering the Colts as one of the greatest teams in in the history of pro football. But as it turned out, the Jets turned the tables on Earl Morrill who was the league's MVP that year, and John United, who was sidelined with a sore throwing shoulder. 
running back Matt Snell scored the only t Jets touchdown and then added three Jim Turner field goals and the Jets, as long, uh, along with the whole American Football League, gained legitimacy with a 16-7 win in Miami's Orange Bowl. Joe Namath, of course, made the famous guarantee of the Jets winning the Super Bowl, was good on his word and was named the game's most valuable player. And that is this week's top five hist events in sports history. So coming up next will be our shout out segment. And we got a shout out to two NFL teams that made the 1996 postseason very memorable. And it was two teams that didn't even make the Super Bowl that year. So stay tuned for that. And we're back with our final segment of the show is what we call our shout out. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and you're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. And our shout out for this episode goes to two teams that made the 1996 NFL postseason one of the most memorable ever. Now, the final two teams that made the Super Bowl that year in New Orleans was the New England Patriots and the Green Bay Packers reaching Super Bowl 31. Yet that postseason will be remembered for two other teams that didn't even exist a few years earlier. And that was the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Carolina Panthers. Now, both teams were in their second season coming up from expansion. And they were expected to go through their usual expansion blues until they were able to get their feet, from, feet under them and compete on a regular basis. However, both teams would find success in just their second season and do it in various different ways. Now, the Jaguars were members of the AFC Central, which was led by former Boston College head coach Tom Coughlin and was led by young and dis he had a young and very disciplined team and was guided by a young quarterback from the University of Washington named Mark Brunel. Now, the Jags finished this, the regular season, the second season for that matter, on a five game winning streak, which included a slim 19 to 17 win over the Falcons to get them into the playoffs for the first time ever giving them a 9-7 and seven regular season record. Meanwhile, in the NFC West were the new kids on the block, the Carolina Panthers, who surprised the entire NFL that season by not only making the playoffs for the first time, but doing it by winning the same division that had been dominated by the 49ers for more than a decade. The Panthers were coached by former Steelers defensive coordinator Dom Capers and quarterback by Kerry Collins, and they finished their sophomore season with an impressive 12-4 and record and earned a bye in the first round of the playoffs. Only the Packers that year in the NFC had a better record. While the Panthers earned a bye in the first round, the Jags would be on the road at the Buffalo Bills, who were still an AFC juggernaut, despite all of the playoff battles they were involved in for nearly a decade. The Jags surprised the Bills in a back-and-forth struggle when Jacksonville erased a 7-point Bills lead in the fourth quarter and claimed a 30-27 win in Buffalo. Now, the Jags had earned their first postseason win in franchise history and a date with the NFL best Denver Broncos at Mile High Stadium the next week. People were expecting the Broncos to soundly defeat the Jags, who were in their second postseason game ever. After all, Denver was a 12.5 point favorite to beat the Bills, to beat the Jaguars, and still looked upon as an expansion team. Yet, in, yet with the inspired play of Brunel and the receiving tandem of Jimmy Smith and Keenan McCordell and the running of Natron Means, the Jags shocked the experts in all of football world by upsetting the Broncos 30-27 and shockingly advancing to the AFC title game against the New England Patriots in Foxborough. Now the next day the surprises would continue as the Panthers would win their first playoff game in franchise history, beating the Dallas Cowboys 26-17 at Erickson Stadium in Charlotte. The game belonged to the Panthers running back Anthony Johnson, who rushed for 104 yards on 26 carries and earned Carolina their first postseason win and a date with the Green Bay Packers in the NFC Championship game. Heading into the title games, NFL fans were excited to see a possible Super Bowl between two expansion teams. The question being asked that whole week was, could it really happen? Could two teams that didn't exist just two seasons ago play in the big game in New Orleans? Unfortunately for NFL fans, it wasn't meant to be. 
In frigid conditions at both Lambeau Field and Foxborough, the Panthers and Jaguars' road to the Super Bowl would come to an abrupt end. In, early, in the early game that afternoon, the Packers would beat the Panthers 30-13. to, uh, 30 to 13. Brett Favre would throw a pair of touchdowns to in the, in the game, earning the Packers their first Super Bowl appearance since Super Bowl II in Vince Lombardi's final game as Packers coach. Later that day, the Patriots behind quarterback Drew Bledsoe would end the dreams of the Jags, beating Jacksonville 20-6. to So this week's shout-out goes to two teams that made the most memorable runs in NFL postseason history yet fell short. Just fell one step away from their ultimate goal and quickly shed their label of expansion. So that does it for this show, and thanks you guys for listening. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast, and please feel free to drop us a line here at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com, or check us out on our Twitter page at historicallysp2. So thanks you guys for listening, and see you next time. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.